my mission today is to finish on time. Um, it's called being in the room and hopefully you'll see why as we go along but it's a career's perspective on being an electronic design engineer. That's what I was. I'm not anymore. I'm a retired person. Well when I was when I was a working person I used to work for this company called Arm and Arm is the company that makes the processors which is inside everything that isn't an Intel device these days basically so all of your intelligent electronic products engine management units, smart TVs, uh, anything like that are principally all powered by ARM based CPUs. Uh, we'll come on to that. The thing that I wanted to point on this one is here I am a grey haired guy 60 odd still working for this company just before it was purchased. How could I possibly be still a valuable contributor to the research group inside a company like ARM? Um, I was three steps from the top of the company. The company was sold back in 2016 for £24 billion. It grew in England uh, and there were 4,000 staff. To put a scale, £24 billion, 4,000 staff. Um, the big building company, Carillion, which has failed in the last few weeks, had 40,000 employees and was valued at £1 billion before its collapse. So just to put a scale on it, this is 24 times bigger in value and a tenth the size in people, just to give you that uh, judgment. So this is a high-tech company, and there's me in this high-tech company doing something. How, how did that come about? Um, we're going to look into that later, but I want to touch for a moment on, so you want to be an engineer. Now maybe some of you don't, maybe some of you want to be researchers or whatever. But I think one of the first things to grab hold of is these definitions are not very well defined out there. People don't really know what it is that they want to be or the areas that they want to go into. And so I'm just made a, here's a, a, a very quick solution, a one-liner really. Engineers create, they produce stuff. Um, it's not, you're not measured by how clever you are, you're not measured by what, how well you've handled the theory, you're measured by getting stuff out. Your prediction that you've made about being able to do something and then about delivering it, not handing it over to somebody else to do, doing it yourself. So that really is a hands-on part of being an engineer and it's worth, worth emphasizing that. The reward comes with doing it, not thinking about it or even getting close. Scientists discover Technicians use. Don't undervalue either of these two. There's not one which is superior to the other. They are different. Technicians are very good at applying what has already been defined and they will be far better at it frequently than you are. You can get some really good coders, you can get some really good wood carvers. Uh, these are technicians who have honed their skill of doing something which somebody else, somebody else has defined for them. Scientists, they discover essentially from the fundamentals of nature. They are exploring ideas and concepts and trying them out on nature because it's the scientists which, which provide the abilities which the engineers will use to create stuff which the business people will sell to customers like you and get money. And that money flows back down the whole life cycle <coughs> and makes it all possible. So that's enough for the background. I'm now going to talk about coping with change because as an engineer you have to deliver. And one of the things that you have to do is to cope with change when this is going on. So to me the start of what is electronics was the electronic amplifier. And I think it's a, it's a good, good vehicle. But when you think that a relay, 180 years old today, was invented back in 1833 is actually the first amplifier. We're still using it today, miniature read relays, but actually people attempted to make computers using relays. The concept, the mathematical concept of the computer was, was viable soon after that. The valve appeared 110 years ago. You still use them in your microwaves. These are technologies which haven't gone away, they've just moved. There are other things that, they, that uh, they're not so good at, but there is some things which they're still fairly unique at. And the, uh, the magnetic amplifier. Um, these days you'll find it most 
in your three-axis compass in a flux gate sensor inside an integrated circuit. But the concepts were dealt with in magnetic amplifiers back in 1885, 130-odd years ago. Now, what is it? Sorry? flux gate, what is magnetic it? amplifier, yeah, what do you do? Uh, it's, it's an amplifier. It controls the current of a, um, out of a, uh, an output port by a control current in an input port, which is less than it. What's magnetic about it? It uses the, um, the magnetic current, the, the, um, the magnetic flux is modified, so the coupling between a primary and secondary of a transformer is only viable as long as the coupling, as long as the magnetic core is not saturated. By, by saturating the core, you can separate the primary and secondary of the transformer. And so they control the saturation of the core with the second winding, which is orthogonal. But there are other tricks they do. There's actually a beautiful picture that I've got of a multi-flux um, path transformer. And you can steer the flux from one path to another via a third winding. Uh, it's a lovely, lovely diagram, but I couldn't put it in here. It's just too complicated. But the guys got pretty good at using technology like this. But if you think about that as one amplifier, so the one transistor, if you like, if you want to think of it in a modern context, the density was not high. People used these very cleverly uh, and very thoughtfully, but an awful lot of... The first time I encountered radar, uh, they were controlling the um, rotation of the uh, antenna, and they were controlling 10 horsepower electric motors, three phase, using magnetic amplifiers in a feedback loop. You know, that was the sort of thing that they were doing in the Second World War uh, and the, uh, on, on destroyers and so on where they had radar. So these, these are interesting technologies. I built a first switch mode power supply about 30 years ago using a, uh, a toroidal transformer and saturation. These are, you know, there are applications where a knowledge about these techniques is useful because you might actually find that there, uh, there are ways that they can be applied today. And the three-axis compass uses just that. Um, you have a, uh, uh, a small sensor which is sensitive to the uh, direction of the Earth's magnetic field. And essentially you measure using that, uh, that small piece of, uh, of it's a magnetic material, I'm not sure what material it is, but essentially you measure the subtle change in the point at which that, metal, uh, at which that material saturates. And you can, you can detect the difference between, caused by the, magnetic, by the Earth's magnetic field and which direction it's coming from. So that's how they work, and it's the same magnetic amplifier concept, just an implementation using a more modern technology. Uh, 1947, this is Baby, the first computer which was the first stored program computer which was uh, implemented in Manchester and I think it's, the, it's a general purpose stored program computer which essentially means it's a computer where the program is outside, the, uh, outside of the computer. There was computers before that but they were fixed, fun fixed function computers. They were just calculating um, you know, they'd been machines specifically to make, to calculate log tables, for example. One of the things that were, they were doing, log tables have fallen out of use, rather, these uh, last 30 or 40 years. But actually, prior to the general availability of computers, uh, slide rules and log tables were the, the tools that engineers used. And they were certainly the area when I came in, through the education system, I learned to use both of them. Uh, the concept of the... Uh, the pro of the computer here, interested, interestingly, is in implemented in valves. So these little cans along, along the racks are actually valves. You used to have a little metal can which clipped on the top to stop them falling out. Um, also helped with cooling. But the, why did they implement it using valves? Why didn't they use transistors? Most of the engineers at the, uh, who were there at the time would not have known what you were talking about if you mentioned transistors. So it wasn't, it wasn't there being perverse. They didn't know about integrated circuits either because they hadn't been invented yet. But the guy who was given the job of making a general purpose stored program computer used the technology that was available to him. That's all he could do, guy or girl. Uh, and I think that that's an illustration of what you'll find continually as far, as far as engineering is concerned. Engineers have to use the technologies which are available to them. Now, 
If I'm an engineer today, there are technologies which are, let's say, on the shelf. So we're talking about quantum, we're talking about graphene. You know, these are technologies which are out there somewhere. But as far as applicability to a product is concerned, neither of those are applicable yet. So an engineer also has to recognize that there are technologies, sciences, to use my definitions on it, which are available out there and yet actually you wouldn't include them in your product when you're designing your product because the product is about delivery. You can't, you can't stop this product, you can't fail to get to the market because if you do as a business you'll be out of business. Um, so you, if, you, if you base your product on the use of graphene technology and graphene doesn't yield or graphene can't be produced in sufficient volume then you're failed as a design engineer. Because your, your job as a design engineer is to deliver, not to get close to delivering. So the first transistor then made an appearance, uh, Shockley, Bardeen and Britain, um, 1947. It doesn't look much like what we'd recognize as a transistor, so it's a proof of concept. Um, there was an improved version of it fairly soon after. And I want to mention Bardeen and Britain because apparently Shockley was an absolutely terrible manager. Uh, he, he took all the glory, but it's the other guys who did all of the work. So if you want to be professors, then you know that's how you are. He's apparently a really nasty character. 1951 was the first commercial in, uh, transistor. And the way that this is made is very interesting because that's if you peel the can off the transistor, that's what it would have looked like inside. It's actually a single piece of germanium with two pieces of indium which were stuck on the side of it temporarily. The whole lot was warmed up until, the, until it nearly melted, producing some alloy junctions. And the downside was most of the time the junctions actually met. And so that in the base region it, didn't, it wasn't a transistor at all. The thing about this that is significant is this is a one at a time manufacturing architecture. So it's a transistor which is made one at a time. If you want to make millions of them, this is not a good way to go. And it also means that they are very expensive. So people became very ingenious at how they make circuits to use as few of them as possible because they were expensive. Now, the thing that also happened about that time, because I was involved in this, and I think 1949, which was between the transistor being invented and it being commercialized, I was born. I popped in on the scene. Electronics had already been going for 16 years when I was born. The businesses were already supplying electronic products to consumers, and those consumers primarily uh, were the professional market in those days, but they were driving improvements. So the magnetic amplifiers were getting smaller, getting more reliable. The transistors were getting smaller, getting more reliable. Um, and year on year, we were already seeing Moore's Law. It wasn't called Moore's Law back then. Moore's Law hasn't happened. But the electronic amplifiers were getting smaller. They were getting more sophisticated. People understood how they worked better. The materials involved, the manufacturing yields and so on, and setting up production lines. The, the, quality, the quality and the quantity and the cost were continually improving. And then with every time that there was a shrink, with every time that there was a cost benefit, then the applicability of electronics to new market domains started to emerge. So already it was moving from the professional to semi-professional consumer. So when I was born, fairly soon after I was born, when was the uh, Queen's um, coronation? Anybody know? 1955? Sorry? 53. 53. We bought a TV in 1953 to watch the, uh, the coronation. So my mum and dad bought this TV. It was a nine-inch black and white TV. It's a little tiny screen like this. And all the neighbours came in to watch it. Because there wasn't things like channels. There was this broadcast. That was what it was all about. So it's uh, really exciting. Anyway, 1957-58, the integrated circuit happened. Now, the real breakthrough in this, you look at that transistor and think about the previous one. You'll see that the transistor is flat as opposed to standing on end. The main thing is it's not really revolutionary. You look at that and you say, well, that's what the cross-section of a transistor looks like today. Today, it's a planar architecture. It fundamentally changed the way you make 
transistors. You don't make them one at a time anymore. You wait, make them a wafer at a time and you scribe them. And that means that the cost goes down hugely. It was also a much more reliable way of doing the junctions. So you, did, you had a much higher yield to start with. The other thing was just a couple of years later, in fact one year later, Kirby realized, well, there's no reason why you should stop at just transistors. You can put other components on there as well and start to think in terms of putting a whole circuit on there. Now, prior to this point, transistors had been discrete devices. At this point, you'd started to think in terms of designing circuits. You were still designing circuits which are essentially analog, transistors and resistors. You'd made the transistors much cheaper and you'd made the integrated circuit a possibility just by the change of the architecture. That's an interesting thing because the architecture is nothing to do with electronics. It's to do with chemistry, it's to do with a concept, um, it's to do with the, the manufacturing process and that had come about without essentially changing the electronic. If, it, if a, a designer was actually designing a circuit at that point it would just be a transistor. The architecture of the transistor is a secondary consideration. Well, this is the uh, first proper integrated circuit. Robert Noyce started the company, Fairchild Semiconductors, to manufacture this. Four millimeters across as a package device. He used to sell it for $120 a piece. Now, that's at a time when $120 was probably worth about $1,500 today, if you want to look at it in equivalent circuit value. Four transistors and four resistors. That's what it looked like more closely. And I, I, for an interesting exercise, I drew the circuit. So just from looking at that, I drew the circuit. Now, the exciting thing about that is that was probably about the last time that you'd have been able to draw the circuit from an integrated circuit, OK? Because we know that this is going to get, sh get smaller and smaller, and it becomes ever more difficult to actually do that. But you can see that when that was designed, they didn't use a logical design method. They didn't use anything like spice or a simulator. They just drew it. They knew what they were making. They just drew it. That was the, that was the reference. That was the circuit in itself. <clears throat> but the people were prepared to, to pay a lot for this because it gave them circuit density. What was it? It's a flip-flop. Flip so anyway, it was 1965 that Gordon Moore eventually caught up with Moore's Law. Because it had already been crunching on for 16 years by the, time he, uh, by the time he noticed it. But he was designing integrated circuits with 30 to 40 components on it at the time. And uh, he was leading a team that was designing an integrated circuit with around 80 components. And he made the observation that this was doubling at a rate which was, you know, people had, the, the evidence was in front of their eyes. It's just that they hadn't seen it before. And that complexity rate that, uh, that he predicted was broadly wrong. But it was, it was a good indication that it said that, uh, that this thing was happening. And he said by 1975, we might be looking at 65,000 devices and he was not talking about transistors he was talking about devices but about that time 1965 that's the complexity of an 80 trans an 80 device component one quad two input NAND gate you can still buy a 7400 series devices in CMOS these days this was bipolar I don't think there are many uh, bipolar uh, TTL logic uh, devices around these days. I don't think they still do TTL, but maybe they do. Um, a little more complicated, but the design tools are still very much hands-on. You don't need to be designing this thing as logic gates. They are logic gates on the outside, but inside they're transistors and resistors, and that's how they were designed. <clears throat> now, the significance at this point is that 1964, which was one year before that, I left school. I um, was a bit of an educational dropout, so I left school at 14 without any qualifications um, and joined the MOD, uh, the test establishment, doing an apprenticeship. Turned out to be a good thing. I apologise for, for the picture. It's the only picture I've got. Uh, I don't know what I was chewing, or what I was thinking. It's an awful picture, but there you go. You've got to use what you've got. I can't go back and snap it again. 
Uh, the thing about it that's interesting is in 1964 I was going out into the professional electronics industry and this is the sort of kit which was available at that time. Uh, so although we, we got transistors available, mostly they weren't in production, in production items. These were, that's a really high quality radio receiver whose performance is still par excellence and that's the inside of it. It's, uh, 15 valves, 15 tubes, depending on what you'd, how you used to describe it. It's an excellent receiver, an excellent quality receiver, again using the technology that was available in the day. Now the interesting thing, an interesting thing, is if you look at the top, there's a panel that opens like the bonnet in your car. And the reason is, you expected to service something like this. You expected to change the valves, and also if you turned it upside down, there's a panel on the bottom, you expected that the resistors would die, the capacitors didn't last forever. And one of the things that I was learning as an apprentice at that time was how to service stuff like this. <coughs> how to calibrate it, how to, set, how to set it up. And if you wanted to test the valves, you had a piece of kit like that to do it. And it was pretty, uh, it has a CRT in that little round hole, but because it wasn't terribly bright, then it had a, sh a shield around it so that you could see it properly. Um, excellence using valves, analog signal processing. No digital signal processing, anything, anything near this. Digital signal processing simply hadn't been invented. About that time, uh, soon after, we started to see the changeover from valves to transistors in this professional equipment. And if you look at the two top diagrams, the, the um, one on the left is the diagram from uh, this timer. It was just a six decade counter, that's all it did. Uh, and then they, they subsequently replaced the decade boards in it with this transistorized version which literally took the valves out, put, the tra put transistors in its place, reduced the power supply and got rid of the heater voltage because you didn't need that anymore. But the transistors were stuck on pretty well, soldered on the back of the board. They hadn't even really worked out how to do, how to attach transistors, how to mount them. But it was an interesting exercise from our point of view because we, of course, still had to service this thing. So we had to learn about transistors to understand how to fix them. And, uh, and we had quite a bit of fun buying expensive transistors and burning them out because we didn't know how to... Uh, but at least we saved a lot of fingers because we were quite used to the high voltages around inside these things. And that usually woke you up if you were a bit sleepy in the morning. Um, <clears throat> So by now, the double diffused transistor architectures and poor yields kept, kept the costs high until this point. Um, the trannies, oh, that's it, that's the other thing that happened about this era, is that we all suddenly got transistor radios. And the reason was that the planar transistor had reduced the cost of transistor radios to a level where ordinary people could afford to buy them. And the idea of carrying around a little radio with a, with a single battery in it that, uh, um, that had a reasonable lifetime and a uh, performance which was quite credible. You could hear the music, you could tune into the radio stations that were available. All of a sudden it moved into the commercial world. It became the must have. These are your iPhones and, uh, and smartphones and your, uh, your, your uh, iPlayers. This is the must have gadget of the 60s and 70s. Interesting that valves at this point had served electronics for 60 years already by then. They've only served 50, transistor has only served electronics for 53 years. So the transistor hasn't actually been as ra around for as long as valves had been when valves started to phase out. At what point did we start getting products from, from Japan, small small About this sort of time. They started, the Japan started fairly soon after the transistor radio because um, Sony be, rapidly became the transistor radio to have, as I'm sure you, re, you re, recall. Um, the, there was other ones, uh, lots of other ones. Everybody who was a, uh, in the electronics industry wanted to, to get into transistor radios. Anyway, by 1970 then, moving along just a little bit, the integrated circuit had evolved to this point which was called Large Scale Integration, LSI. Now the main thing about this one which is different is there's a lot more gates in it, but also it was designed as gates. So it wasn't designed at a transistor level in the same way. That was the diagram 
that the person who designed that chip was using. We knew that there were transistors inside there, but he didn't need to know that. He only needed to know that the layout of an XOR gate, the layout of an AND gate, layout of an inverter, and he could place those blobs down and connect them up to make that circuit. So this effectively was the first circuits that were being designed where logic gates were used inside the design process, not transistors. Now, there are transistors in there in the same way as there are transistors in there today. The other thing that was novel about this is it's a 4-bit ALU, arithmetic and logic unit, and it's implemented as a bit slice. Somebody had noticed <coughs> if you're going to make a computer, then 4 bits is a bit of a small unit. You need 8, 16, or 32 bits. Implementing this as a bit slice meant that you could put four or, or eight of the chips down on a board to make an extra wide word, but you could also put four or, four or eight of them down on silicon for the next generation of process as well. So they, they'd already started at this point to think in terms of modularity of design, reuse of design. These are the times when these things came about. This is where they started. And it's worth remembering that, again, I'm now in the design loop of this thing. I haven't started to do my first chip yet, but this is the era in which I'm finding myself. I'm having to learn, as a designer, to handle a different design methodology because the design methodology existed before this was at the transistor level. The vast majority of the design is now starting to move to the logic level. <clears throat> well, in 1970, with that sort of technology, this sort of computer started to make an appearance. So this is the computer that you had in your office or um, main factory. It was mostly used for accounts, because accounts being naturally numeric are the first things that, uh, that people want to computerize. It wasn't really until uh, the universities had started to conceive of the idea of doing logic simulators that, uh, that it started to become viable to think in terms of a computer like this for doing design simulation. Now, it hadn't been necessary to do design simulation for that four-transistor, that, um, uh, four four-resistor flip-flop. Uh, and when you assembled it into a bigger thing on a board, the design simulation you did was making it work. You had a scope, you had a power supply, and you had some signals, and you fiddled it until it worked. The idea, therefore, of creating a model of something stems from that era as well. Although most people at that time, 1970s, when I moved into that, were not actually simulating integrated circuits. They were still designing them with care and with the eye. This is around a MIP of performance, one million instructions per second. And, uh, and of course, today you have more than a fraction of that just in your, uh, in your smartphone. Uh -uh. Um, so we had to do, when we started using simulation on that, everything was done using a batch. You submitted a job twice a day, and you looked at the output, and the output was a stack of line printer paper. So you didn't have anything uh, like a VDU. They would have, have monitors here, but they were only uh, ASCII monitors. 1971, Intel introduced this 4-bit processor. Now, we would recognize it today as a processor. It's got the, the characteristics of a CPU, and, uh, but actually it's only four bits, quite small, uh, quite slow, only a few thousand transistors. It fit into a 16-pin dual inline chip, and it was actually a calculator chip. So in, they, there's a company called Boscom who actually ended up called Unicom, uh, make it, wanted to make this calculator, and they wanted it to be electronic, and so Intel designed that chip to make it possible. So what, you, what you've effectively got here is a, is a computer. And it's the first computer, and it wasn't recognized as being, sorry, the first integrated computer, and it wasn't recognized as such. But the world spotted the 4004 and started to use it for all sorts of things. It's about that time that I, I also encountered it and used it to drive a piece of test equipment for manufacturing test. So if you like manufacturing test, had become the technology leader in, in the integrated circuit business because the products, we didn't need to have the same volume. You're only making four, five, six pieces of test equipment. You don't have to justify the last penny. You don't have to get it, uh, squeeze it into a certain production package. It was possible to use this thing purely for the utility that it gave you, the flexibility of the test equipment. So that, that's not programmable. 
It is programmable, yes. It's an external, it's a, a general purpose um, stored program computer. So it had an external memory, an external ROM. It was programmable in the sense that it could be programmed. It was not programmable in the sense that you changed the program. So it was a calculator from, from your point of view. But what it was doing was very much the same as a four-function four uh, calculator does today. It's executing things which are routines which are embedded in it, but it is nevertheless the routines are resident in ROM. The processor calculates the number using the programs which are resident in ROM. But it is a proper computer in the sense that the, the program is outside the, pro outside the computer itself. Anyway, by 1974, I had, I had um, recovered my wits and gone back to university and uh, came out with a beard, which makes me a lot more, look a lot more intelligent. Uh, and I got a first, and I thought, right, it's, I'm now God's gift to engineering. So I went out there, uh, believing that I was going to be able to impart an awful lot of uh, new knowledge and technology to this innocent company who was waiting to employ me. And... Um, so, that's it. A good, good degree and lots of confidence means that I was rather self-opinionated. Some people would say I haven't changed in that regard. Um, but I started with this company called TMC, um, one of the first companies in the UK to, do, to think in terms of applying this new microelectronics technology to ordinary products. And the thing that this company had focused on was bringing microelectronics into telecoms, so into um, the telephone exchanges and the, uh, uh, the, the electronics that the consumer was using but were not really aware of, the infrastructure electronics. And it did very well over history. They got quite a lot of electronics into places which were predominantly electromechanical at that time, relays and uh, the, the related technologies to that. They used a, a, th a technique called four-phase dynamic logic, which I'd never heard of. It was very clever and it was very ingenious. And you could understand perfectly well why they used it. But actually, the university, my course, never touched on that. I didn't know anything about that. But I fairly quickly had to pick it up. Uh, but what I learned, actually, was just how little I actually knew. Because the en incumbent engineers had been using this and they'd been using other stuff as well. They knew quite a lot about the exchange technology and they knew about how telephones worked and how signaling happened over distances, um, how the signals were, were relayed, as regenerated. Uh, they knew an awful lot of stuff like that I didn't know. And it became apparent to me fairly quickly that I brought some new ideas, but mostly I was learning from the experienced people that were there. The good news about that is I knew enough about it to understand some of what they were talking about. So where was the electronics? It had moved on a little bit, but we're still using terminals like that for writing programs. I mean, this is what uh, you did your, pre your presentations on, a uh, slight overhead projector, OAP. <coughs> Commercial electronics, radio was five to seven transistors, all signal processing was still analog. You could just about get four function pocket calculators and if you're prepared to dig deep in your pocket, the HP 35, the first scientific processor had just been launched. That was based on a 4-bit CPU as well, but HP designed their own. Um, single uh, computer batch accessed, 74 series logic, got to watch my time. Um, <clears throat> productivity do tools, diaries, address books, magazines were all paper. Writing was biro on paper. Cameras were mechanical and chemical. You know, the, the sort of stuff, that's, that's where I came into the business. And that's what a telephone looked like in those days. It was a very clever construction, which you could talk about in itself for a good hour without any difficulty at all. But the thing of interest in this case was this unit. This is the dialer. So when you put, you put your finger in the hole and spun it round, three, four, five... This dial went back at a controlled rate, and as it went back, these contacts went tick, 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 tick. And the pulses are the thing that the exchange recognized, and the pulses are the things that, um, that made the telephone work, made it connect to where you wanted to connect to. That was my first project, to replace that with an electronic solution. And I had to use this four-phase dynamic logic, and I designed a circuit which, which went behind this. I had a guy working for me who did the plastics uh, and I made a, an integrated circuit, 250 gates, 
9 millimeter dyne, about the same size as an average chip. Um, but the thing about it was, my responsibility was for the whole dial. So I didn't just design the chip, I designed the printed circuit board, the external components, used some external transistors where necessary to get drive, I had to have a clock from somewhere, that had to be provided. My responsibility was to design the whole of that dial replacement because the company I worked for made the telephones, they could take that dial replacement and they could drop it into the production line and deliver telephones which were push button telephones which were really sexy. We didn't have push button telephones before that. We had no, no memory yet or anything like that. Just rather than have to dial, you just push the buttons. Now that's, that's the sort of era when, when you are making the first integrated circuit, that's where I was. Now, I use this diagram, it comes from an odd period of time, 1999, International Technology Roadmap for Silicon is what ITRS means. And if you've got any knowledge about this, you'll know that ITRS still exists and they predict what's happening in the next couple of generations of process. This one came out in 1999 and part of the reason that I like it is you can extend it back to when I started pretty well. Just draw the line back a bit further and you'll see 1995, 1975 rather, 1,000 transistors on the chip. And you can see that by the time you got to the bottom end of this curve, 1981, this is when the first IBM PC appeared. This is where 10,000 transistors on an integrated circuit enabled the computer to move on to your desktop. Now that's a professional desktop. The Apple, so this is where the Mac appeared, 1984. And then the ARM chip, we'll come back to that one. The reason I mentioned the ARM chip is the ARM CPU appeared, 1987 at the level of 200,000 transistors on an integrated circuit. It's already moved up quite a bit from 10K to 200,000. Now, the ARM chip wasn't the, um, uh, the significant factor in this, of course. ARM CPU is the thing that goes forward, and we'll see that in a minute. But the ARM chip, when this appeared in 1987, this is one integrated circuit. This is what it looks like. This is what one of those 4-bit ALUs looks like if you put it onto there. You already see that it's starting to disappear quite quickly. This is a CPU, so it hasn't got any memory management or anything else like that around it. It is a very useful building block if you're making a computer, but it's not a general purpose thing yet. It is still giving you performance on your desktop, and the sort of performance that you, you now have available to you gives you a graphical user interface. Pretty poor, but prior to that time, people were just using an ASCII interface. Waveforms, when I first encountered them, were illustrated by I's and L's and X's. Uh, you could do a pretty good impress impression of waveforms running down line printer paper using that approach. But the target at this point was to get a computer in every school. So we're now moving you know, away from professional into more of the consumer domain. You haven't got one computer per person, anything like it, but you might have one, per, one computer per school. So Moore's Law eventually gave us ARM. So that's where the Archimedes came about. That's where the ARM BBC Computers in Schools program event uh, happened. But ARM itself, as a provider of CPUs for incorporating into integrated circuits didn't happen until around 1991 and it was about the million transistors on the integrated circuit which actually enabled that because the problem was <clears throat> at that point it had become so difficult to make a whole integrated circuit that people wanted to use big blocks they wanted to use things which have already been designed before because that made the, ta the task of filling a chip the task of utilizing the functional capability that an area of silicon gives you had become so complicated that they couldn't design it all from transistors anymore. They had to start using blocks which had been used before. ARM happened to be there at the right time. It had a CPU block. ARM knew how to put systems together. They knew about the software and the operating systems that needed to be introduced in a practical system. 
and were just there when the market really woke up to the fact that it needed CPUs. It needed to get the productivity, the silicon productivity that software enabled you to do. So this was one of the first chips and we designed this one up the road in Plessy, um, what was Plessy at Robra, and it still is Plessy, come to think of it, um, but it's, re it's regenerated itself since then. There's your 32-bit ALU and you can imagine now your 4-bit ALU is down here somewhere, well lost. And this of course doesn't represent where um, current ASIC implementations are, this is 1991. So moving, moving right along, we find we extrapolate two things here, the red line and the blue line, so we extend it forward. I'll come back to the red line in a moment. But the main thing that you see is that we're now looking at the order of billions, tens of billions of transistors per integrated circuit. Now one thing you know about billions of transistors is you can't use the same design methods you, that you used when you designed a chip of four transistors. There's a lot of different eras which have gone through there. And as a designer, I've had to live with those eras. I've had to find out what, what they were talking about when they were talking about this new thing. I had to try and understand, was it going to be available reliably when the product that I was supposed to be designing is going to come out? I also had to, 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 to find out how to use it. How was I going to be able to use this technique reliably? Because again, the technique may be reliable, but if I've misunderstood it and I bodge the, the uh, implementation, then it's a failed product and failed products are not, you're not rewarded for failed products, you're rewarded for successful ones. So all of this, these eras are accompanied by major changes in methodology and extensions of the design space. We've seen software come into this, but we've seen uh, logic synthesis come into this that didn't used to be there. We've seen test benches come in on when designs are so complicated that you can't look at the output waveforms and see if they're working anymore. We've seen the design move from discrete transistors into logic transistors, uh, into logic devices. All of these things have, have occurred during my working lifetime. Now the other thing that happens is all the time, because I'm a typical engineer, I beat myself up on how little I know. So I'm, I'm inclined to go into a room and think, somebody says, about this new era, this new thing that people are talking about, you know, what's the situation? You go, oh, actually, I've read about it. I don't really know very much about it. What you're forgetting is you're an engineer. When you read about something, you understand things that, that Joe Public in general doesn't understand. The marketing people in your company may not understand it either. You're probably among the best people to make some kind of judgment, despite the fact that you have limited knowledge. So you will always have limited knowledge on the areas that you're working at. You will be able to make judgment, you will be called to make judgment, but you have to make that judgment and you have to have some working knowledge of the things around you and where the technology is moving to. Otherwise you're not valuable. Anyway, that amounted to 200,000 times increase in functionality since ARM was founded through to today. 200,000 times, even in a company that's got this IP idea the environment has changed hugely. 20,000 times more transistors. And let's look at a billion transi transistor integrated circuit today. Well, 2012 this was. Uh, it just happens to be a, um, a chip where I could get a die shot of it. Um, and it's NVIDIA's Tegra 3 processor 2012. They had a billion transistors on this on 45 nanometers. A billion is a thousand million in case anybody has any difficulty and there's three of them. So you have to remember that a billion transistor integrated circuit still has transistors. They are still in there. There's an awful lot more connection on that than there was on that simple four transistor integrated circuit that, that, that this thing started with. And that in itself has given increased capability, functional capability on the integrated circuit by another 10. So we're talking about around 2 million times more functional capacity in an integrated circuit now than it was when ARM was founded. Now I am somewhat behind so I'm going to have to scoot along. Moore's Law didn't happen because of one company, it happened because of global teamwork. That's what that one says. A die full of transistors is not a product, so no matter how much you you have the capability of producing a billion transistors or 10 billion transistors on an integrated circuit. Connecting them together is what makes it do something, and that's the process of design. 
So productivity had become an issue. The red line is transistors per engineer per day. And you could see that the productivity gap was, ex was, was screaming away. And, uh, and so it meant essentially that single designers, which is where I started, had become global teams. Clean sheet design had become reuse. These are the era that you're now working in is reuse, but not just reuse of transistors, reuse of sub systems and subsystems. Uh, the, can the camera is an interesting one because it goes a little bit more recently. Even 1998, just before the turn of the century, this is what a state-of-the-art consumer um, high-quality camera looked like, and it still used film. A uh, 2005 camera is still essentially the same device, but it's got all of this additional um, electronics, the computer, but it also has sensors and transducers, precision mechanics, micro motors, energy sources, uh, discharge tubes, uh, precision forming of plastics and metal, and also, most significantly, integrated manufacture. You can't make this thing by hand anymore. You have to use robotics. And so the manufacturing, the way that you're going to make a product like this, has also become part of the design ch challenge. The electronic system design, which is now in the era that we're working with, is systems designed to work as a, as, as a functional alloy. This is system design. I'm going to scoot past this a little bit because that's telling you about ARM. So the thing that's, <coughs> that's driving the technology today is the consumer. These are the people who are buying things in their millions and billions. ARM shipped 13 billion ARM CPUs last year. The number might have been 20. Even so, that's more than one per every person on the planet. Um, and these, this buying power means that the focus of technology evolution is in the highest volume areas. And so if you want to still make a mainframe computer and you can still get them today, then you use the technologies which have been defined by the consumer markets, which is worrying because the consumer isn't interested in the technology for the technology's sense. The consumer is interested in the functionality that, that they can buy and put in their pocket, whereas the professional may be interested in the technology because of what it's capable of delivering. A takeaway on that one is old markets remain. You can still buy mainframes and minis and personal, but they have to inherit the technologies which come from the lead markets. So a product is a commercial opportunity. I've probably emphasized that. Was doing all right. Um, <coughs> but it's got to be functional. It's got to be available. It's got to be economical. It's got to be manufacturable. And it's got to be innovative. It's got to be innovative to compete against alternatives. And as a design engineer, your role is to deliver that, to architect the product using the technologies which are available and deliver to, to supervise whatever you're doing. If it's a software module that's going to be, you're still using techniques and methodologies which are available to you, or whether it's a piece of hardware, whether you're a, a member of a team or the team leader, or else, the role is still the same. You've got to deliver predictability. You're predicting the future, and you've got to deliver against that future. That's pretty good, and if you succeed, Despite the odds, you get to keep your job. You don't get rewarded for doing what you're supposed to do. So my career took me from this really early technology right through to today. How did I keep there? How did I do that? Well, my professors, my degree taught me enough of the language of EE and science so I could go into rooms with people, listen to what they were saying, contribute a little bit, and help. Because products are always designed by teams, not by individuals. And team faces problems, which means that they're looking for somebody who knows something to help to, get to resolve that problem. And you can do that. They, the, my degree gave me some hands-on experience, which is really useful. Main thing is they taught me to think for myself. Because the vast majority of your career, you're going to have to be learning for yourself and you're going to have to be directing your evolution. If you want to step off this mad, conv uh, this mad railway train, this, ex this exciting re scenic ride, you can do so. There are other jobs that you can go into. Engineering is never a bad basis. But if you stay with it, there is nothing more exciting. <clears throat> but to stay valuable then, you've got to stay in the room. And this is where I come to the idea of being in the room. 
There are rooms, there are spaces where decisions, where issues are discussed, where decisions are made. If you're not in the room, you're not part of that. To be in the room, the room is a team, it's a meeting, it's a company, it's a different thing every, every now and again. The thing about it is you have to stay valuable to whoever calls that forum together because they want you to be a contributor. They expect you to be a contributor. And if you keep on contributing, they will keep inviting you. You will experience lots of different rooms and your career is determined by the rooms that you choose to go to. So don't go to rooms which are not relevant to you. If you're interested in things, become an expert in some areas. Don't try and become expert in areas where you are basically not interested. You'll never be really good at something that you're not interested in. You've got to be interested in this because this is, it's your nighttime reading. It's the book that you have beside your bed when you have a bath or even when you have a shower. These are the things which make you into, into the engineer. So, conclusions. My last slide. Not bad. <clears throat> your, life, your working life will see as much change as mine did, probably more. So I saw a lot of change. You're going to see a lot of change, not less. It may look like it's still, but it isn't. It's changing as you, as you speak, as we speak. <clears throat> your job will always be to deliver. Your degree gives you a starting point. That's all. It's up to you to keep yourself relevant. Being in the room makes, means making sure that your hosts continue to value you. And finally, you will know when you're an engineer when other engineers seek your professional opinion. It's not what the IEE tells you, or the IET, or BCS, or anything else like that. They just have an opinion. That's when you know you're an engineer. So thank, thank you for listening. Thanks, Jan. Right now we have a problem staying in the room. Yes. So run like hell. You'll find this presentation and others available there. This presentation will go up in the next couple of days as a video, so don't panic. The PDF will go up fairly quickly. Um, if, you want any present, if you want any information, Guido knows me, so, that, so, that, so does Angelo. I've got an email address. I'm not sure if it appeared on any other slides, but if it did, you're quite welcome to email me. Thank you for listening.